Mike, check. Mike, Mike check. check. All right, um, so just for time's sake, I'm going to start up because I wanted to wait until, like, everybody got here. I'm waiting. I wanted to wait for the rest of the students. But at the end of the day, I still want to show up. Like, it's been here, like, since 6 o'clock. Some have been here since 6, you know, so we can just kind of get started. But I'm really um, excited um, tonight. And um, can we welcome all back with a big hand, everybody? Thank y'all so much for coming. And we'll extend the hands even further when the rest of the group arrives. So thank y'all so much. And um, in case anybody doesn't know where the West Wednesday is, it's basically something that was started. Thank you. Something that was started when my brother Tyron West was brutally executed. He was murdered in Baltimore City on July the 18th, 2013. And so for now, for 211 weeks, my family and supporters and I have been tirelessly fighting for accountability. And so far, we haven't seen it. Like, so, I mean, at the end of the day, that's not going to make us stop. You know, it's very important and needed for us to continue this fight because it's not just for my brother, Tyrone West. It's for all the victims of police brutality, police terror, and, um, and that's why we're out here. And um, just to kind of jump into what happened to my brother so you can kind of um, feel what's going on. And then also I want to ask everybody that comes that's going to get the mic this evening. And I'm going to have my brother share some spoken words. I'm just trying to hold you because I don't want to, because I know he's going to really bless the mic. And I want all the students to get the fulfillment of my brother. But anyway, um, and if you hear students the term mic check, that's just the way we get everybody attention. So you'll hear periodically say mic check. And anybody and everybody that want to speak is welcome. But we're not going to keep you guys really long because we know you got a bus that y'all came on. Some of y'all came to bus the van, but we're not going to like keep it and drag it all the way out. So I ask that anybody that want to speak, I ask that you speak positive. I'm sorry, I ask that you speak positive to our youth. I don't want nobody like noise. Sometimes we use profanity, and not because we want it to be like. All the language and things that I need, but we be so frustrated. This, thing, this fight is not something made up. I don't read from a script. I don't read from a book. Everything comes out of love. Sometimes it comes out of frustration because after four years, you get real frustrated of seeing so many people play games and it's horrible. Then they're playing games at the expense of our lives. And that's the part that's disheartening and sad. And so if y'all kind of court things online, so Cool. Oh, yes. Awesome. Yay. So we're right on time. So, yes. Yeah. So now everybody, let's give oh, everybody a warm welcome. Yeah, so we were waiting for y'all. Thank y'all so much for coming. We really, really appreciate you guys so much for coming out to our uh, West Wednesday. And I was just letting them know so that, like, so we know we open up the mic for people to speak. So I'm asking that when you come up and speak, please, like, we, I want them to be very respectful to you guys. I don't want them coming up like saying a bunch of potty words, bad words. So we're going to keep it nice and clean. We'll keep this G-rated, guys. So any old way, but thank y'all for coming out for West Wednesday. So my brother Tyrone West was brutally murdered in Baltimore City on July the 18th, 2013. And at that moment, it changed my life forever. Like literally, we wasn't good enough to get that phone call that nobody wants to get, that your loved one was actually murdered. Literally, had it not been for the grace of God, God allowed me to feel my brother's pain as he was being beaten and tortured for doing nothing wrong, not for breaking the law. Only thing he did wrong was being at the wrong place at the wrong time, and these were wrong cops that actually executed my brother. Because they almost killed the man 24 hours, the same exact Two to three officers that pulled my Mercedes Benz over. They pulled up on the round house 24 hours before they killed my brother. And then there was a guy named Abdul Salam who lived in that community with his baby son. And he same killer cop, Nicholas Davis Chapman, Officer Weed, and Omar. They were the same ones to beat this man while he had his baby in the back seat of his car, just coming from work coming from the supermarket, making mark and had um, plans to take um, his babies out to celebrate the 4th of July, which would have been coming in a few days. But nevertheless, my brother had just left me, picked me up at work, and I thought that my car 
was a safe haven because we had community violence happening then. This is not something that's unusual. Even though we have a spike in homicides now in Baltimore City, it's outrageous. It wasn't as outrageous as it is now, but it still was in existence, and I didn't want my brother to become a statistic. So at that moment, I let him borrow my car, and I wish I would have just told him no, because maybe my brother would have still been living. But I had to live with that because I said he could go pick a young lady that was stranded, that called for a cab. Her cab never showed up, and she was trying to get to her mom's house. So she literally called my brother and said, could you please come get me? Please ask your sister, can you come get me? And he said, he asked me, and I said, sure. And when my brother left, and not, me not knowing that this was going to be the last time I was going to ever see my brother again on earth, we were talking about Trayvon Martin. Because that birth kit just came, and I don't know if y'all know about Trayvon Martin. It was George Zimmerman. He um, wasn't even a police officer. He was the standing ground, the standing ground with the gun law thing, and he basically executed uh, a teenager just because he thought he looked suspicious by he having on a hoodie and he had uh, a bag of skittles in his hand and a nice tea. So that, like, and when we saw that he walked completely free, was not charged. That was the first time something else literally jumped out of the TV into my home and affected me. Like, I, I don't drink, smoke, or anything, but at that moment, I called my brother, and I asked him to go with me to the bar. He's like, so she's talking crazy. You don't even drink. But I'm like, I need a drink. And this was the weekend before my brother got killed. But the last conversation before my brother's child on West pulled off was, sir, we got to worry about all the Jewish Zimmermans in our neighborhood. And I'm still a teacher. Like, now, I just got finished teaching camp. I teach school all year round. Right now we're in to the camp season and also getting my classroom ready the next month for when my um pre-kindergarten students come in and kindergarten students come in. But nevertheless, you know, I had an officer in my classroom that day talking to my baby in my classroom about being safe in the city. And I'll never forget when my brother picked me up, I walked up the car, I was so excited. I had this dead bear on my hand. It was a it was a um, bear that the police officer gave me. It was called Dare. It was a dead bear. And I wanted to take it home and dress it up silly for my students so that way I can encourage them to play with it and talk to it and kind of tattle in, in, in dead bear's ear instead of telling the teacher tattles and whatnot. So I was just getting ready for that moment. But nevertheless, my brother was executed. Nobody never told us. The funeral home hit my brother's body for five days. The very next day he went. Once we found out and saw my brother's um, body on the news, I recognized early that that was my vehicle. My fiance told me this was your brother that just got murdered and I couldn't stop crying. And it was like, it was like, that was my reality. Now I'm like, and so I'm, it, turned me, it transformed me overnight, literally. I used to be the shy one. Like even at my class graduation, I never wanted to talk to my parents. I would kind of do what I tell my students to do. Find a place on that wall. Don't look at your parents. Just look at that place on that wall and talk and read your poem, sing your song. And that's what I would do. I would find myself using my own advice. But now I have been all around the world talking to not just um, students, but talking to everybody. Parents, victims of police brutality. And it's cool. I wouldn't wish anyone into the one to the side. It's not cool at all. And I always tell people it's not about the income, it's about the outcome. I had to recently remove my name from a settlement issue that you probably heard about on the news now. But I thank God that God is good that my brother's kids are able to get something and whatnot. And I love them. Like, I'm going to always keep on fighting for them. Like, I do this not just for my brother's kids, but I do it for my kids. I do it for his grandkids. My, his daughter just recently had a baby girl that he would never be able to see. His beautiful, gorgeous grandbaby. So for me to hold his granddaughter in my arms on Sunday brought me so much joy, but then it brought me sadness because when I started to leave, because I felt like I'm enjoying your life and my brother can't. And it's horrible to feel like that. So when you get joyous things that you should be joyful, I'm looking at his beautiful grandbaby. I'm looking at his beautiful daughter who just gave life, but at the same time, I'm so happy. But that fast, my joy got stolen because I'm like, it's not fair. My brother should be able to enjoy his own daughter, his own baby, uh, his grandbaby. Like, and it's not fair. Like, he was executed. So we don't know how 
I don't even know what to like literally say, and I don't want to rap you on, but just to make me sad, I don't want to make y'all sad. So the point of what I'm trying to tell you is, police brutality is very real, and that's why we all here. Like, it's a beautiful day, granted. The sun's not shining too hard. You got a nice, cool breeze. But people will tell you, we don't pay attention to the weather. Like, we're out here in freezing cold weather. I'm out here because I love human beings. I don't look at people as black or white. I look at, at them as being human. And at the end of the day, my, my people and my community that look like me, that have the same skin color as me, are getting executed at a random pace. Like even in the city, they're not keeping us safe. And this weekend, I found myself at a peace fire event, and I literally had to go up there at a peaceful event where church folk were giving their singing. The beautiful 13-year-old girl was singing a song. The man just got off the mic. A beautiful girl singing a song and was interrupted by a police running an event at a peaceful rally, tasing a black unarmed man. Tased, he already tased my daughter, the man was shaking, running through, but I didn't realize the man was even tased, and I thought they were trying to tase, because every last one of them had a lime green taser out, about 20 cops, and then, thank God that Brother Boom is here tonight, and Brother Wolf was way back there, but they actually saved this man's life, they put their bodies on the line, all I could see was Boom, I could see Brother Wolf running, and it was like, we got him. And all because the man walked past the police car and said, I want to kill myself. So y'all can go in and kill me. And then another guy that actually put his body on the line, he was a rough he didn't do nothing. He just threw it like when they were trying to tase him again, they pulled the tase out. The guy said, no, stop. And they said he was hindering um, the police. And he was arrested, but thank y'all for my sister Bird, who was able to like talk. I don't think he, I think she said he didn't even get arrested, but then the time for Russell had not been for my sister Bird being there. And she's a good media person. She always talks to people. So she was able to make a few phone calls and de-escalate that situation. But I'm thinking that man knew his life was on the line. For him to cut through a peaceful event, he knew, hey, should I go this way? They're trying to kill me. I got a 25 police officers on my back. They already done taste me. I don't have a shirt on anything. I need mental health. Like, I need to be in the hospital. But I don't want to be in a cemetery. So let me run this way. And thank God, he ran in the way we were. But I just wanted to let y'all know, we have to live through this. But throughout all this, I still remain with love. Because to me, love is the answer. I don't act off the hate. I don't even hate the people that killed my brother. I don't hate anyone. I hate what they did. Yes, I do. Do I forgive them? No. I have to go to that point. No, I don't think I'll ever forgive them. Let's be crystal clear. I don't think I will ever forgive none of them. Because no one had control enough to say, I'm, I'm going to stop. This man need help. Let's get him up. So I'll never forgive them. That's something that y'all, if y'all lose y'all can something y'all got a problem, but I would never forget them. Never ever. <coughs> but I don't hate anyone. I act off for love. I don't love them either. Let's be crystal clear. Don't love them at all. But I don't hate them. That's a big difference because when you start doing to me, hate spreads sad. And I think that's what's wrong with the word. So if I took on hate, I would be just as guilty as these killer cops. If I'm acting like hate and not love, you wouldn't have got nowhere wouldn't have got nowhere. So I always say I encourage you, please don't do things off of hate. Take the option of love. Even if you hate to do it, don't take that option off of hate. Like, take it, put it on love. Focus on love. Because that's what saves lives, that's what gets you to, and that's what keeps things positive. And I'm out here for the love of my brother and my brothers and sisters and community dollars. And to me, Holy Society has no face really. Because it's a victim to me. I don't look at it, I don't care if it's a victim, white, black, Chinese, or whatever. Race, background group, I don't care. It's a victim. But I've seen a lot of black people being victimized every single day. I can't act like, I can't give y'all no fake speech and say, oh, well, everybody's getting victim. That's not the case. That's clearly not the case. And I, I'm going to leave y'all this little before I'm open up with a spoken word. I'm going to give everybody a chance. Talk, but I just wanted to say something that scared me on the news. It was two brothers that were actually victims of police brutality, right? From Baltimore City. I'm talking about Baltimore City. Tyler Trump was beat down on the bus stop. They saw it, it was cool on video, and not even the police footage, 
It was caught on the street camera. It was caught this far you thought was showing K-Maker's ass, right? Court, so he won his civil trial. But mysteriously, Tyler Trust is now dead. And they're just saying, mysteriously. I don't want to hear that mysterious foolishness. I want to hear what happened to Tyler Trust. He was a human being. What happened? Did he get in the car wreck? Did he choke off something? Did his house burn down? I don't want to hear that mysterious death. What happened to Colin Trump? And I'm not going to sleep until I find out what happened. Then also, did somebody else go to get a payoff settlement that survived being shot five times by the police? And they just found him dead. He got shot in the head one time. That sound mysterious to y'all? That sound like the Baltimore Police Department doing what they did. They are a living, live gang. And I'm just gonna call it state to state. They can get away with murder, robbery, whatever they wanna do, they can get away with it. In my opinion, in all this violence, and I'm gonna close on that note, but all the cities and so-called quote-unquote community violence, I still blame half of them for it. Because the same way they got informers that tell what the public telephone is what people in our community are doing, they probably got informing hitters, the people that are going around yelling, doing their dirty work, killing people. I believe that. I believe that. I honestly believe that. And then our mayor want to come over to speak today, talking about we need to trust that police officer to do that. Don't trust them? Are you kidding me? That's like being in an abusive relationship with a man that's beating you down, raping you, hurting you, doing everything in the book to you. And it's saying that you still in that relationship, but you're so traumatized, you still got to deal with this crazy gut face. And you want me to trust them? And let him do his job, really? It's sad. It's a sad time in America. But it's up to us, and stuff like this is very powerful. And we stand together, even if we don't all agree with whatever everybody come up here and say. Because we're going to do some things that, I might have said something that makes me scratch here, like, I don't know. I'm not feeling that. And that's cool. We can all agree to disagree. But at the end of the day, numbers don't lie. The reality of it, Black folks are getting murdered, not just in Baltimore, all over the in the, all over America, all over the world. So if I could think of a safe place, I would have been packed my things. And I'm not, not, I wanted to leave. When my brother got killed, I wanted to leave Baltimore. I was done. I'm like, I'm packing my family up and I'm going. And I remember talking to Uncle Bill, and he said, where are you going at? And that kind of stuck in my head. And I'm thinking like, okay, we're getting murdered every day. So where am I going? I need to stay here and continue on fighting this up the fight. So I stayed here. I was going to move and then come back here. I wasn't going to miss the West Manchester. I was going to move, take a train, a plane, come back here. Everyone's playing with me. But I was ready to go. But I'm here to stay because it is what it is. But I love y'all. And I'm going to have to say, Shorty Davis, he found Mr. Mike Tuck He's sick. I don't know if he got food for you. The last time I was... Before uh, that, I was told to be hydrated or anything. He wasn't going good, but you know, sure, you see, sure, guy with a big need, but you don't need this much. We love you, sure, we miss you. We hope you feel better. And like my wooden sister, Kevin was telling me, sometimes we need to take time for ourselves, but I don't know what that feels like. I don't know how to take time off. My family told me all the time. And I don't want to just pass out and be in the street, you know, hurt, but I can't stop. I won't stop until killer cops are in cell block. Mike check. Mike check. And I'm gonna let this brother open up with a spoken word. Thank you, sir. All right, peace, peace. How's everybody doing today? Good, thank you. Good, good. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful seeing that the spirit of Tyrone West, you know, really moving the people and just seeing the youth out here, you know, people that don't even look like us. You know what I'm saying? The spirit has moved you to really support this cause. Uh, I want to shout out to my brothers in the back, 300 gangsters. Uh, I want to shout out definitely my sister, uh, Tawanda, uh, because without her, we wouldn't be here. Uh, she asked me, you know what I'm saying, did I have a, a spoken word piece? You know, I've been sitting on this for a little minute, but you know, this is the least that I could do for her. So, uh, this is called Sickle Cell. Uh, I hope y'all, I hope y'all like it. Materialistic mindsets. Free slaves to the paper chasers and label makers. Pinocchio sweat. Just like your puppet master, chilling behind the scenes, pulling strings of things you never seen. Ah, think of times I would wait in line to spend my dimes and nickels on quarter waters 
Grant your mother for seeds and mega missiles. Now mega million dreams and dollar schemes follow me until my cells get sickle. Sick in the mind, pennies for your thoughts. All you can afford is a slave in the maze fighting for the Concord James and Gucci. Main or mainless. Freeze frame the changes that pop explained in 98. What about them pages, them lines be in? Talking lion kings and lion queens. PIC profiting every day in the pen. Hold your dollar. Came out of her Babylonian ways. Flip the page, cause it's time to be some lions again. And against the pharmaceutical constitutional change. Finger pointing to blame another Crayola in this game of war. Sitting ducks are sitting soldiers, put them loaded and locked. Recycle lies, the beta's on the idiot box. Institutional deceivers and thievery, trick or treatery, GMO eatery, blocking my scenery of my recipe for sovereignty is an anomaly. Cause honestly, this lion really ain't ready to rock. Simple shout, team soul, not the soul. Y'all can follow me, Kenny Soul, SoundCloud.com. The message I heard. Hope y'all like it. My young brothers get there, that makes me so proud. And I also want to give a special shout out to my brother Kenny, because he's leaving Baltimore and not quite for a long time, but he's actually leaving us on the 21st because he has plans that he want to become this truck driver and make this good money and get back to buy properties and get back. He got a big plan. He's the man with the plan, y'all. Let's give it up for this brother. Mike check. Mike check. Mike check. check. Hey, how y'all doing? Um, so uh, there's a writer, his name is uh, Mumia Abu-Jamal, and he's actually, um, he's actually my favorite writer of all time. And uh, on March the 6th, 1996, he was being interviewed from, um, from a jail cell. Uh, he was convicted of a murder that he did not do. And the guy asked him, uh, asked me, he said, what advice would you give to the young people and how they can bring forth change? And Mumia replied, he said, I would tell them to read all they can and to build themselves, not just mentally, but spiritually. And he said that now you are as free as you ever will be. He said, however you want to look at that, because as you get older, there comes obligations and duties. Marriage imposes obligations. Career imposes obligations. And so right now, you have the opportunity to get the tools necessary to build yourself up. So when it's time for you to fight, when it's time for you to make the change, you can be equipped mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And he said to take the time out to look at the issues that you know are obvious now. Right now, you, you can look around and you can see some of the things that are wrong with society, what is wrong with this world, and you can change that right now. He said, don't wait. He said, the freedom that you have right now, you won't see for decades. You won't see for decades. And so while you have the time to branch out, while you have time to learn and while your brain is still developing, take the time out to read and study and learn and grow and expand and fight now. You don't have to be 35, 40, 20. You can fight right now. That's what Mia said. He went to jail at 28 and he's 63 still in jail fighting. If he can do that, eight books later, he's written eight books. If he can do that from a cell, imagine what you can do right now at this very age. The best thing I can tell you now is to build yourself, but don't sit on those tools. Fight, fight. There's no need of having a broken car and the tools to fix that car and you never fix it. You keep reading the manual, but you never actually fix the car. Actually, fix it now. Fight now. Yeah. My check. My check. My check. My check. So my sister Megan born here, and I'm not her ever so amazed now. I'm not her man born. We were together when Martin O'Malley came in the town. 
trying to become the president, Lord Jesus, that was funny. But she snuck in there. Let me show you why right close to the fullest. She snuck in there with this big old sign in her back pocket. Little old magnet, this big old sign. Before, matter of fact, we walked up before her. They pulled me and boom over. Damn it, it's quick, sir. We turned in the ground. Had the metal detector then a, a federal agent guy came and said, no protest to me. And we like, well, I don't have that job. What you talk about? And my sister, I fell in love with this sister that day. She got and was running around, but had no friends with you. I had this, you know, I got a twenty. Mic check. Mic check. Um, that's actually kind of what I wanted to talk about in terms of using our whiteness to get inside the system and twist it until it breaks. Um, what I'm wearing right now, if I were black and jaywalking, the cops would look at me, come over to me, do whatever they want. The fact that I look, my skin is white, I can get away with everything. And it's real. It is very, very real. Um, and it has consequences. Life has has consequences. People get killed for stuff. For Sandra Bland pulling over. That would never have happened to me, ever. So it's important to understand the power of our whiteness because we live in a world that is ruled and guided by white supremacy. So we have to use it because we can't change who we are. So we have to use it to get access in the system to break them from the inside. You have to, we have to sacrifice something to, to get it for the greater good. And if that means jobs, if that means safety, it has to be done. People are dying simply because they're black. That is it. And so we have to sacrifice something. We have to put our bodies on the line. Have to. And if there are limitations, there are certainly limitations that some people cannot put their bodies on the line. There are other ways to invest in the disruption of the status quo. And it's our responsibility as white people to break it because it's unjust, it's racist, uh, and we benefit from it. So we have to have to um, have to put our bodies on the line. And because I knew that I would get into Martin O'Malley's presidential thing, um, I stuck my the sign. It's actually, uh, uh, this is my second sign. The other one got so damaged, but it's the same thing. And I stuck it behind my shirt because I knew they wouldn't search me. I knew it. So I went in, and that's what happened. And when I was finally stopped by the police. They treated me so gently. Yeah, she got a bag massage. We actually got, I, it was an actual conversation. It was a conversation. And when, during the uprising, when I was out at 10 North, breaking curfew, it was almost as if the police didn't see me. I would just see them look around and then grab people behind me and pull them and brutalize them. And if I was doing the exact same thing. I was at Penn North breaking curfew. And I witnessed a man, Larry Lomax, get pulled down by his dreads and pepper spray for doing nothing, for going like this and wearing an after police shirt. That was it. And it, it was like I wasn't even there. And and what later happened was I testified in his defense because he was charged with assault. And that testimony helped him be found not guilty. So this is what I'm talking about is we have to use the power that is given, that we are born into without our consent. We didn't ask to be born. We have to use that power and use and twist it and use that privilege and twist it and witness things and witness that when when people get brutal, when black people get brutalized, stay, film it, fight it, put your body on the line, stick around, and become a witness in the trial. Because I guarantee you, they're going to charge them with assault. When, there's no, when they've done nothing wrong. So it, it's very important to recognize whiteness, to accept it, to accept the fact that we have privilege, and then use it. So it twists the system until it breaks. Second thing I want to talk about real quick, too, is, is our understanding of anger. And we talk about how we come from a place of love, and all of this work is from a place of love. Anger does not equal hate. Repeat that to yourself over and over and over again. Anger is not hate. We are angry. 
We are angry because people are getting killed for no reason. Well, the reason is white supremacy. We are angry. That is anger and that is okay. It is not criminal. It is not wrong. People are allowed to feel angry. And the issue is black anger is criminalized. Black anger is criminalized. So when you see property damage, or you, whatever you saw on the news during the uprising, that was a manifestation of the anger, and there's nothing wrong with it. It is not criminal. And property damage clearly is valued over black lives. And that's the problem. That's the problem. Well, it's one of many problems. Many, many problems. Um, so, so again, when, when people talk about angry, don't be so angry. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Don't li listen to yourself react to it in the beginning. Because that, rea that your first reaction is the thing that you've been conditioned into. So take a second, recognize that you're reacting to an emotion, and then ask yourself, why is that anger happening? And once you figure out why that anger is happening, that's where the work can be done. But, the, but the, the, the real work can be done. The first step is recognizing within yourself, how are you reacting to things? Because you, your first reaction is conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, so again, anger is not anger is not hate. And this love trumps hate. Well, I mean, does it? Did the summer of love change anything? Did the, the, the hippies in the 60s, did that really change anything? We can all come together and come up. It didn't. It didn't. Anger has a function, and it's okay. And it's not criminal. Black anger is not criminal. Thank you. We all we got. We all we need. We all we got. We all we need. We all we need. We all we need. First, I'd like to thank y'all for taking the opportunity to uh, try to get an uh, uh, overstanding of why we're here today. There's so many issues, as uh, my sister Megan said, I'm PFK Boom, I'm an activist, slash frontliner, slash a piece of the action. What I say to y'all, and what I say for the correction of some of the things that Megan said, and some of the things that we probably heard through this microphone. It's called the future. We still talk about this thing that's called white supremacy right here today, which is an ideology. And what we also overstand is that racism is the fuel to white supremacy. Racism is the fuel to white supremacy. For that to carry on, it means that a walk of people, a mother, a father, a government, a society, has to keep pushing that racism ideology on a certain race of people due to no fault of theirs. Hurt people, hurt people. And most people who are into that a racist state or prejudiced state are hurt people who they does not even talk the proper way. That's a learned behavior. Again, white supremacy, racism, and these isms that we're talking about, he's better than you. Someone said that, and we agreed with it when we are younger or we are, or we are in an environment that breeds that ignorance. Have anyone heard of the ceasefire that they had this weekend in Baltimore? I'm the co-founder of a movement called 300 Gangsters, which we first specialized against police brutality, against all walks of life. What we did at 300 Gangsters is stayed out all night for 72 hours from 12 a.m. third or Friday morning until Sunday, 5 a.m., because that's what we do anyway. But our ideology for ceasefire was the ceasefire on ignorance. It wasn't about the gun for us, because if you ceasefire on ignorance, the gun automatically falls anyway. I want to ceasefire on domestic violence. I want to ceasefire on verbal violence. I want to ceasefire on spiritual violence. So 
All our ills are not because of a God. You just hear about murder. But mom and dad is arguing to a rape that is much more bigger in our eyes than the ears need to hear. That's the violence to us as kids. We should not hear that. So if we go home and hear those things, that's the violence that Baltimore was trying to get to the whole world from a 300 gangster standpoint, that that is violence. Teaching racism to my child, as it is in society, I don't teach my child to disregard or hate or, or fight fire with fire with racism on racism. We sing with that goddess. So the way that I'm saying this is that the way that I break white supremacy is that I have seven kids, two adults, two college grads. I teach them the opposite of what it is and what y'all responsibility is and all the other youth that are out here responsibility is is to get more knowledge of it. Top on West did not have drugs inside of his sock, as they know. Top, Top on West got pulled over exactly the way they said inhumanely and dragged him out by his hair and 15 police killed him for 15 minutes. They never stopped. They never stopped. Anthony Anderson, they picked him up and they slammed him on his head in front of a child about her age, which was his grandchild, and killed him. 300 gangsters should not be here. We're only here because of police brutality. So if police brutality wasn't here, then we should be here because it's here, we have to be here. So until it gets cleaned up day by day, I just say all the facts of cleaning up to make this place better. And all of this place is ran by people. It's people that's hurting people. Legislation, uh, it's people. It's the, you gotta pick the gun up and shoot it. The gun don't just get up and start shooting people. It's someone white, black, Asian, behind that item, and they take someone's life. It's two people who domestic violence and do things that they shouldn't do. So again, I just ask you, us all that we watch our violence, which is self-inflicted nonsense. That's what sin means. Whoever heard what somebody said we shouldn't sin? Who heard that? Raise your hand. Raise that word if you heard it. So raise it high. Don't be scared, boy. Oh, God, you raise it high. I want to see it. That means self-inflicted nonsense in Baltimore. You don't want to do anything that you know is not right. Why are you at that party and you know all them teenagers did? You snuck out your mother's house. You're wrong. That's why your inside is like, oh my God, I know I'm supposed to go. Right. That's self-inflicted nonsense. And then you get in trouble. And then you want to cuss mom out talking about, you never let me go anywhere. That's why I let you go nowhere because you came back to my house drunk. That's self-inflicted nonsense. Somebody in there already did it before, too. I see some smiles. But again, I want you to think about that. And the ones who have already done it, I want you to tell the ones who didn't do it yet, like, no, nah, you don't want to do that. Because one thing you don't want to do, once you disappoint your parents, we lose trust in you. And if I can't trust you, the reason why I'm not letting you go nowhere because I let you go somewhere last time and look what came back to me. I would like you to leave out and come back, as I said, that's why I said I want you in my 11. I said that for a reason. I didn't say it because I want to punish you or I said it because I'm a parent. I'm not your friend. Parents are not your friends. They're parents. How many of you some days don't like their parents? Raise your hand, boom, guys. Raise your hand some days you're mad. Right, good, that's good parents. I'm glad you don't like it. Good, 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 good. Perfect, perfect. Good households over there, I love it, I love it. Exactly, that's parenting right there. It's some things they didn't let you do. Good, I'm good. So if you got parenting, if someone's only got a single mother in there, some of them in there don't have parents at all, if you got parents, there's some of the good values that's on you, and you might see one of your friends in school acting a month. You know how the football guy would act like he's the jock in the school. No, he's not. Sometimes you might want to tell them, like, because you want him to get a scholarship to college. Like, come on, you don't want to be too cocky, John. Like, slow up a little bit, man. You know, he, he, you play lacrosse, you nice, you score two goals, okay. But you're not all that. I play soccer. You know, so we want to keep that ego down. And, and somebody that don't play so good, we want to strengthen them. We all we got, we all we need. And you take that out there with y'all to team. You take that in your house with your little brother. We all we got, little brother. I can't let you do that. So we all we need, we all win. So I, when I end this to say that, remember some of the things that I say on 
investigate you. See if I'm telling the truth. But again, self-inflicted nonsense can never lead us wrong. That's what's going to get you in trouble. So think twice. Be like, what did Boone do? And Boone said, no, nah, don't do that. All right? And again, the ones who raise their hand about their parents that's not so good in your eyes, welcome to the good league of good parents. Salute. Have a good evening. I want to check in um, real quick because I want to make sure. What time y'all bus leaving? Because I don't want to over. Eight ten. What time is it now? Because we got to. Seven fifty-two. Oh wow, so yeah. So let's kind of make it. I'm gonna let my brother JC speak and yeah, but uh, we definitely appreciate them. Then I want to take a quick group picture with us too. Y'all looking good. I'm gonna be up in there. JC Falk, founder of Circle of Voices and the Into Ignorance. First, I want to. Thank Tawanda. I want to thank Tawanda um, for what she always gives to the city, and I pay homage to Tyrone West for what he gave to America um, after you know what happened with the police after they murdered Tyrone. So I want to just always pay homage to him. First, I feel like we're in school a little bit, y'all, because y'all here. So I want to just want to say that first, and everybody's everybody's like talking to y'all, right? Like preaching to y'all, and I want to uh, I don't want to do a little bit of that to myself, so I want y'all to know that before I do. But I, I want to. First, say this thing: Are we talking about white privilege, or are we talking about white supremacy? It's interesting. Um, first, if you look up the word race, though the terms race and species in a dictionary, those terms are synonymous. They're synonymous terms: race and species. So, what are we doing with race when we say that one person is black and one person is white and one person is whatever it is that we're separating people from humanity? by these categories that we have, right? So we go and we say, some people are in this category and they deserve more because they're in that category. And some people are in this category and they deserve more because they're in that category. And some people in this category. And we make it that some human beings are less human than others when we separate ourselves out like that. So that's the first piece I want to say. That it's a bunch of BS that we do that in the first place. So that's the first thing. Second thing is that it's actually real. On the ground, if you're black, you could die because you're black because we've been socialized to believe that black people are less important than white people in this culture. So both of those things are, same, are true at the same time. One, that we are all in this family called the human family, right? We're all in that same species. But the other half of it is, is that we are separated out and people are murdered because they fit into these social groups that we have. Let me change that. That white people have established. White people have established that white is at the top and then everything else is below that. And it's really white males at the top and everything else is below that. So I want to put that out first. And I've been noticing this term that we've been using lately, folks, called white privilege, you know? The term sounds so pretty to me right now. Like, what is white privilege? Like, instead of saying murderers, instead of saying killers, instead of saying abusers, Instead of saying, you know, these people who have destroyed millions of lives over centuries on this planet, we say this pretty little term, white privilege. Like, what does white privilege mean? Does that mean you go to Starbucks and you get your coffee before the black man is standing behind you? Is that, what does that mean? Does that mean you get a better interest rate on your loan when you go to buy a house because you are not black? Like, what does that mean? So what I want to call out is that we are making these terms a little bit prettier than what they have to be, or that what they should be. White privilege is blood money. That's what white privilege is. If you go into some place and you know, you grow up and you go, hey, I'm white in this culture, and I'm going to get something because I'm white, then if you get that thing, you're getting it as a result of the black man getting killed around the corner. Even if you don't see the murder, and even if you don't have the weapon, you're getting it because that dude died. You're getting it because black people in this country suffered. You're getting it because slavery existed in this country. You're getting it because some of you, your parents, got the benefit of all of those years of subjugation of other people in this culture. So when you're getting those benefits, just know that you're getting those benefits because other people have died for you to get them. And other people are hurting for you to get them. Like if you look, like if you look right here, if you just if you came in and you just dropped right here at City Hall, you know it's not bad looking around here. Pretty decent, right? You go over a couple of blocks, it's pretty cool. You go a few more blocks, and because people are black and they're poor, they're living 20 years 
less than the white people who live four blocks away from where they live. 20 years in some parts of the city. Black people are dying 20 years younger than white people are dying in the city. And they're dying because of white supremacy. Or white privilege. That pretty little term called white privilege. So as you grow in this culture, again to the young folks, and then to the, you know, some of us old heads too out here, as you go into this culture, anything that you're getting as a result of somebody else's suffering makes you a colluder, makes you a part of the structure that has people suffering. And I just want to say that so that you don't forget that. And like, this is a good time for you to start learning that and knowing that, that white supremacy and all of this racial dominant stuff won't go away. Sexism won't go away. Homophobia won't go away. Transphobia won't go away. So racism won't go away until white people make it go away. Black people have been trying to make it go away for centuries in this joint. It ain't gone nowhere. We want it to go every day. We want it to go every moment of every day. And we can't make it go away when white people want it to stay. So white people need to wake up. Same thing for men. Sexism will not end on this planet until men wake up and stop it. Until men wake up and stop it. So it's our time, and it's your turn as you're starting to get a, like, I'm probably three or four times older than some of you over there, most of you probably. And like, you know, it's something what I, that I've come to conclude in my life is that racism won't be gone when I die. Racism won't be gone when you all go. Racism won't be gone when anybody out here goes. Sexism won't be gone. Transphobia won't be gone. But I'd be damned if we can't move the needle a little bit. If we can't move it a little bit while we live, move it while you live. Mic check! Mic check! I'm going to let my brother, um, Ryan, speak. Uh, and thank you, brother. I ain't going to be passing out another beautiful thing. Thank you so much. But um, I would let you know, uh, my sister, Jen, she has a pretty um, black lives matter shirt. So if y'all interrupted in, she started like a donation. What is she at? Oh, can you stand up so they can see your shirt? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, she was sponsoring um, Welcome to the Black Wednesday. And messages were made like y'all want to order one. Sorry. Y'all can't lie. Y'all can't. And it's really nice and cool. So I just want to thank y'all so much. And Brother Brown, when you see your We'll probably close with Wayne O'Shea in a few words. And to take our picture. What time is it? Because I'm going to open that day. It is. It's probably 8 o'clock. I wanted to say a lot of people have been going on about white supremacy. And I wanted to sort of come at it from a different angle. Because, you know, I'm, I tend to come at this whole thing from the angle of faith. And my, and my Christianity. And in my tradition, we talk a lot about, and we've heard you know, Martin Luther King and so forth refer to racism and white supremacy as the original sin of America. And the, I find that to be a really good way to think about this because white supremacy is your original sin. Original sin is that thing that you're born with that's so fucked up about you that you can't fix and you can't get away from. And in the faith tradition, the answer to sin is not guilt, it's not you know self-abasement, it's repentance. Repentance is from the Greek to think again. So what I want to call on everyone to do is every day think again about the world they live in. Remember, every step that you take in the United States of America is taken on ground that was stolen from the native people as part of the greatest genocide in human history. Think again, if you get a nice job in finance or law or education, the northern, the, in this part of the country, all of those legal and financial institutions started as a way of processing the money from slavery. 90% of the United States exports prior to the Civil War were slave crops, cotton and tobacco. And all of the northern industry and all the northern banking interests and all the northern educational interests processed that money. Every, I, I, I used to work down in, uh, down in D.C. And every weekday, I would drive along a road called Rolling Road to get down to 95, to get on to, the, to, go to, to do my daily commute. 
It wasn't until years later that I found out that that road was originally laid out on that course so that slaves could roll hogsheads of tobacco down to the ports. This is the way that white privilege, that white supremacy is built into your country, built into your life. And you can't, you can't like stop being white. You can't stop people from being heard. You certainly have to try, and, 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 and I'm totally behind Megan on that. But the thing you have to do is never, ever stop being aware that what you have comes from a history of oppression. Mike check. Mike check. I'll be real quick. Um, are you guys familiar with the Hillel quote, if I am not for me? Does that mean something to you? It means a lot to me too. Have you been really scared in the last year or so since the, the neo-Nazis started coming out? It's really scary, right? I'm Jewish. And growing up, kind of hearing stories from our grandparents about how it used to be. But while recognizing that we're white and we get, we're not going to get shot on the street for just looking a certain way. But um, you ever used to wonder, you know, how, we always say not again, right? Never again. And what's happening on our own blocks, right? So I think it's our duty. Um, and for everyone here who's not maybe familiar with the, the expression of Hillel, you guys want to say it with me? Because I love, this is my favorite thing. Um, if I am not for me, who will be? If I am not for others, what am I? If not now, if not now, when? So you could look at, yeah, Hillel was a cool dude. You can look at that and you can boil down the entire morality into, yeah, we have to stand up for ourselves. We also have to stand up for other people. There were lots of people that didn't stand up for our ancestors. And there's a lot going on right now that it's really important for us to stick together. We say never again. We, we should really be saying not now, not here. Um, so thank you so much for coming. We're really happy to have you here, and thanks to Tawanda. She is a real role model. You read everything you can about West Wednesdays and Tawanda Jones, okay? If you want to see what courage looks like. She has been out here every single week. Every single week. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, So, before I bring my brother, I know we rushed it down a minute, but I just want to give a special thank y'all so much. My we got five minutes for Brother Moss to do a little two minute speech and we'll take a new 50 y'all to bring you over. Thank y'all so much. I hope that y'all take something back from this. Thank y'all so much, buddy. And I'm definitely, it's a hard time for my family. I just want to thank y'all again. Thank y'all so much. What do you do, family? How y'all doing? How y'all doing? How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Y'all feeling good? Y'all feeling good? Well, life has been tough for me. Me just walking up towards you, how you feel? You feel a little bit intimidated? been a little bit like he's invading my personal space. Why? Why did anybody feel that way? And if I walk up to you like this, well, how you feel? You felt a little a lot bit more comfortable, right? A whole lot more comfortable, right? Why? Why do we all feel that way? You know why? Because we were trained to feel that way. We got to stop feeling that way. Because that's what's causing all these issues. That's what makes you believe something totally different about me. You have no clue that I'm a teacher. I teach quantum physics and anthropology. You, you see what I'm saying? Something, because I see the three of the gang, you see the jeans, you like, oh, I know that he's, he looks kind of offensive. Like, I don't know. <laughs> but at the same time, I learned all about history about the time I left elementary school, because my parents were teachers. Their parents were teachers. I used to speak in the, for the Baptist Convention and represent in all the different debates across the country when I was 12 or 13 and all the little shows and they thought I was cute and giving all the statistics and quoting all the Bible scriptures. But when I walk down the street, the police with my ass every day. The same guy that was representing the Christian faith for all of you and we were singing in church and we was, all the cultures were together and unified. And the same guy. Please literally broke my hand. I only got two knuckles on his hand.
that I'm fighting for, the same guys that I'm representing, don't think that I'm gangster enough. They don't think I'm black enough because I had street hair. Because all the girls was digging my profile. You know what I'm saying? So I always got in the fight and I ended up being shot, stabbed, see all these marks in my head and all these. That was just all because I'm being black, growing up black. Or how we look at each other and how we treat each other. And all y'all need to understand that these folks that you see up down the street, they didn't, they wasn't, they didn't expect to grow up and had to deal with the color black. They thought they was gonna go be doctors. They thought I was gonna be police officers. I thought I was gonna be a minister. I thought I was gonna be a minister. You understand what that feel like? When y'all just felt that up and that down with me? Man, imagine that was your life. Can you feel me? Can you feel that? So all of the foolishness that they tell you about what he is because he's black or what she is because she's a woman, all that is bullshit. Okay? Don't let nobody tell you nothing unless you know that this guy is a bum right here because he don't wash his drawers and he, unless you, you can, everybody right now, prime example, and I'm, and I'm done, prime example right now, everybody, think of the most bummest, laziest, slobbish, brokest person you know. Instantly, didn't somebody pop in all of your heads? Instantly, look, she's like, yeah, no, Derek, he was a little musty the other day, I don't know. Family, you don't want to be that person. You get my, you get my drift? That's a personal choice. You know? But when it comes to being racist, when it comes to being sexist, when it comes to being black, those are all personal choices for y'all. It's not a personal choice for me to be black. Okay? That's all I want everybody to understand. When you look over and you say, man, she can't do that because she a girl and she slammed up you. Uh, boy, when you thought I was dab on him, you see what I'm saying? Never estimate, I never estimate anybody. Don't go around this world trying to be a tough guy because it's always trying to, uh, somebody trying to win that title. And it's always going to be somebody that wins that title. Uh, but are you willing to be shot? Are you willing to be stabbed? Are you willing to be hit up and grazed by bullets all around my body no, for that title? No. No. You better go ahead to school and get that edge of location. Edge of <laughs> Get your edge of All right. <laughs> Dab on that. Uh, and I'm out. <laughs> we got one minute left. Can we just take a brief picture real quick? Thank y'all so much. Everybody put the sign down. Uh, we'll grab them. Thank y'all. Love y'all. Thank y'all.